So welcome back friends. In the previous video, we had an introduction of Kubernetes. What it is usage, how can it benefit us? And now today in this video, we will learn the major components that are required to build a Kubernetes cluster. So the aim here is to give you an overview of the different components. So we already learned that Kubernetes at a high level does two things. It provides a cluster to run apps. And the second function is it serves as an orchestrator for your cloud native applications. So the Kubernetes cluster consists of two parts. It, cons it is built up of control pane and worker nodes. So the control panel implements the intelligence. Some of its functions are it exposes an API for various operations. It also has a scheduler for assigning work the work is assigned to the worker nodes okay but let's not go there let's understand all the components one by one so it takes the responsibility of keeping your apps healthy when we see keeping the apps healthy there are various aspects that come under it first one is you know self-healing so whenever there is any error or any problem with your app kubernetes will notice it and it will do whatever is necessary to bring the app back to running status the second, second is, you know, upscaling and downscaling based on traffic. We talked about this in much detail in the first video. So it will scale your app up and down based on the traffic. And it will also do role. So whenever you want to update the version of your app, it will help you do it with, you know, minimal or no downtime at all. So now the, what does the worker node? The worker node actually does the hard work of actually executing your apps. So there will be, you know, lesser number of control panels who do the management and more number of worker nodes where the actual app is actually running. So, so on a broad level, the major components are control panel and the worker nodes. So running your app on Kubernetes has some very simple steps. First of all is design and write your app as, as simple microservices second is containerize your microservices third is wrap each container in a pod so this is a new word kubernetes pod we'll explain you in detail what does it mean and then fourth is deploy your pod to kubernetes cluster using various controllers so in Kubernetes, we have different various controllers to do different things. Generally speaking, some of the containers are deployments, daemon sets, stateful sets, cron jobs, etc. There are many other containers as well, but these are the some, some of the main containers. So whatever features we learned here, like self-healing, auto-scaling, rollouts, these controllers help our apps achieve this. So they help or in a way augment our apps to achieve the various cloud native features like we already talked about it, self-healing, rollouts, scaling, etc. So these controllers help our app achieve this. So Kubernetes like to manage your apps declaratively. What we mean declaratively is you set a configuration file set to Kubernetes or you give it to Kubernetes and then Kubernetes actually does the necessary things to deploy your app, configure your app, run your app and not just run your app and continuously monitor it to see whether it is running according to the configuration that you gave it or not. And if it is not, something is changing or missing, it will do the necessary actions to again match the configurations that you have given to run your apps. So wherever there is a difference or a difference from your configuration, Kubernetes will try to fix it. So as we already said that Kubernetes is made up of control panel and worker nodes. So as we said in the earlier video, this control panel worker nodes can be deployed anywhere. They can be deployed to a Linux server or a virtual machine to a public cloud, a private cloud or you know any IoT device as well. So let's talk about the control panel so basically it has many services that run together to do the intelligence of you know managing your apps for example 
it has the API server, then it has the cluster store, then it has the, the scheduler, and then it has and then it has the cloud controller manager. So the API server is like grand central station. All the communication between various Kubernetes components should go through the API server. So we can say all communication should go through it. So we mean the internal communication. It includes the communication between the internal system components as well as external user components as well. So it has a REST API. So what you can do is you can post your XML configuration files to it, to the REST API. These configuration files are also called manifest files. So what do you define in these XML configs? You define the desired state. What do you mean by desired state? By desired state, we mean this is how our application should be looking when we see it running in the production or when we see it running how much space should be used it, it, it how much memory should it be using which port should it, it be exposing which other services should be present when our service starts and which which other external dependencies should our this application require everything how many nodes should be there whether should it upscale downscale whether should it work according to the traffic and lot of things Basically, we define a desired state and then we post it to the API server and then Kubernetes takes care whether your application while running is matching with the desired state or not. If it is not matching, it will do the necessary actions to make it matching with your desired state. So you post your desired state to the API server using its REST API by making post calls. Of course, these calls are authorized. Is it not like it is an unauthorized call? You anyone can call, anyone can post it, it. No, it is an authorized call. And after authentication has happened, you can post your manifest files or your XML files. So as soon as your file is received, immediately is it, it is persisted in the cluster store. So if we talk about the cluster store, so it is, you know, the stateful part of the control panel. As I said in, earlier, whatever manifest or XML we post to the API server, it is persisted in the cluster store. So it stores the configuration and the current state of the cluster, our Kubernetes cluster. So it uses a very popular distributed database, which is etcd. So it uses etcd for storage. So the cluster sort is the single source of truth. And since it is very important, all the configurations are stored in this cluster store, we should run more than one replicas of it, sometimes on in different avail availability zones, so that you know, if, if there is a failure at one, one zone or one node, we have other replicas of it, so that we can get the configurations, and our configurations are not lost. So this is done to achieve high availability. So another important aspect, or an another important service of the control panel, which we missed was controller manager plus the controllers. We talked about this earlier as well. So let's see what is it. So controller manager implements various controllers. And what these controllers do, they continuously monitor the cluster components and they respond to events as well. So this controller manager is kind of a controller of controllers. So it controls the different controllers. So we already gave an example of the different controllers available. For example, the deployment controller, the stateful set controller, the replica set controller, and many other controllers. So all these controllers are responsible for some particular function. So we can say a small subset of cluster intelligence. So each controller takes care of some small subset of the cluster intelligence. And overall, when we have all these contr controllers functioning together, then this, you know, creates a, a very intelligent 
cluster manager or a very intelligent control panel so all these controllers try to achieve a particular function and the function is that the observed state the observed state that we posted to the api server with the xml files or the manifest file and we told that this is how our app, app should look like when it is running that particular observed state should match with the actual state the actual state how the app is running right now so if the observed state is not matching with the actual state these controllers will try to find out the difference and then try to rectify it so that the actual state matches with the observed state so depending on which controller the function lies the controller will act to make your actual state match with the observed state so this particular logic is implemented in each of the controller first of all it will obtain the desired state then they will observe the current state then they will determine if there is any difference and if really there is a difference what is the difference so they will determine the difference and then they will reconcile the difference or make minimize the difference or make the difference zero so that the actual state matches with the desired state so they will reconcile the difference and each of these controllers is very specific to their own function so so all these controllers are very specialized and are only interested in managing their particular responsibility they don't care whether the other controller is doing its part correctly or not they are just focused on their function and whether that function is working properly or not whether that part of the observed state is matching the actual state or not so each of the controller takes care of its own function it does not care whether the other whether the function of other controller is being performed correctly or not they are only concerned with their own function and their own actual state so you know they are very specialized in their function and their functions don't overlap with each other now let's talk about the fourth service in the control panel which is the scheduler so basically it watches the api server for new scheduled task and if there is a task then it assigns the task to healthy worker node so as we already said that there can be lesser number of control panel nodes and more number of worker nodes which will actually run the job so suppose we have many worker nodes available then how will the scheduler decide to which worker node should i assign this task so it so in this case the scheduler follows a pointing system it it assigns points to all the worker nodes based on various factors and then whichever node has the highest point is assigned the task so on what basis that the scheduler assign points to the worker nodes let's see so it checks whether that particular node is tainted or not then it checks if there are any affinity or anti affinity rules so we'll we'll understand these concepts in a more detail in our upcoming videos but as of now you can say that if there are any affinity or anti affinity rules it checks whether the port that the application requires is available or not and then it checks whether that particular node has sufficient resources or not so it does initial filtering on these rules and after filtering then it assigns points based on whether whether the required container image is already available or not how much free resource is available how many tasks is the resource already running and so based on these factors is assigned the point and based on these factor it does the filtering and then the node with the highest number of points is actually selected for executing the task and the important thing to note is that the that the scheduler is only responsible for picking the node it is not responsible for actually running the task and it you know it only actually picks the nodes and assign the task but it is not really responsible for actually 
running that one. That is the work of the worker nodes. So these were the four important services that made up the control panel. So the control panel runs these important services. And these services are, you know, the brains of the control panel where all the controlling and scheduling decisions happen. So these services are the API server, the cluster show, the scheduler and the cloud control manager and the different controllers. And, you know, this API server is kind of the front end of the control panel. The communication that needs to be done with the control panel is done using the API server. So friends, we learned about the control pane. Now let us learn about worker nodes. As already mentioned, it in a Kubernetes clusters, there will be fewer number of control panes because their work is to control things. But there will be larger number of worker nodes because these are the nodes on which the actual application or services will run. Okay, so the worker nodes have these three important functions. The first function is that they watch the API server for new tasks or apps. So keep, they keep watching the API server whenever a request comes to deploy a new service or perform a new job or run anything new. They are already waiting for their chance. They keep on watching the API server. The second is obviously when actual work comes or a task comes or a request comes to run something, they take that request and they actually run it. So this is the this is also an important function. And third is report back to the control pane and API server about the progress of the task, whether running has started, whether it is in progress, whether there is any error, whether they cannot run it, everything, whether it has completed everything, they will rep uh, report back to the API server, which is part of the control pane. So everything they will uh, keep reporting to the API server and the and each worker node will individually report to the API server. It will not talk to each other that I, that I am not able to run this task. Will you please try it? No. All will uh, respond to the API server like each student responds to the class teacher. They should not talk to each other and coordinate. They should respond to the teacher similarly or each player should respond to the captain of the team. In that way, all the worker nodes uh, communicate with the API API server, which is part of the control pane. So these are the three important functions of the worker nodes. Okay. Now worker nodes, each worker node is made up of three important things. The first is the kubelet. We learn about kubelet in more detail. Second is the container runtime. Okay. And third is the network proxy. It is also called kube proxy. Okay. So let's first talk about the kubelet okay so kubelet is the main agent that runs on each of the worker nodes okay it runs on each of the worker nodes so whenever you add some new resource into your kubernetes cluster or whenever your kubernetes cluster starts so and the starting time also all the nodes need to register with the cluster so whenever you add a new node to your kubernetes cluster First of all, Kubernetes will install Kubelet on it. So they will install Kubelet on it. And then Kubelet will be responsible for actually registering that node to the control pane in the correct way. So it will, what will, in the registration, what will it tell? It will tell about all the details of that worker node. For example, it will tell how much CPU it has, how much memory it has, how much storage it has, and and all it details, it will register itself with the control pane. Okay. So, and after, after registration is done, they, it will do one more important thing. It will watch the API server for new tasks, which is as I already told the, the work, the job of the worker nodes. So it is the kubelet inside the worker node that continuously watches the API server for new tasks. Okay. And where it gets the task, execute the task. Again, it is, it is also a responsibility of the kubelet and as already said coordinate with the control pane and you know reporting channel maintain a reporting channel keep reporting back to the control pane about the progress of this task whether whether it is successful whether it cannot run the task or it is in progress whatever is the status report back to the control pane in the correct way so this is also an important job of the kubelet so all these functions the kubelet does now kubelet is the first part of the Work. The second part is the container runtime. Okay. So, so your 
your worker nodes run containerized apps so for doing the basic behavior of containers like pulling the image from the image repository starting it stopping it everything for this the worker nodes require a container runtime okay so that is why they need a container runtime for performing all these container functions so so kubelet needs a container runtime for pulling images starting shopping containers etc or for all these they require a container runtime now earlier docker was integrated into kubernetes only but now as explained in the previous video if you want more details please check out the first video i will place a link of it in the top of this uh, screen as well but uh, the gist is that now kubernetes have made the container uh, runtime as a pluggable so they have made it pluggable so any run any container runtime that implements the container runtime run interface cri can can work with kubernetes so as of now the default runtime is container d all these i have explained in the earlier video also but i am just repeating so the default runtime is container d which is basically a stripped down version of docker itself itself so so the kubelets need a container runtime for container operations and any runtime that implements the cri interface can work with kubelets by default they use container d which is you know a stripped down version of docker and all the docker images will run perfectly fine with the container d runtime as well okay so it is a plugin based there can in future any other runtime any other uh, interface can also become the default uh, interface in kubernetes but as of now uh, to my knowledge it is Q, Q, container d is the default runtime okay so this is the second part of the worker nodes the first part was kubelets second part is container runtime and the third part is cube proxy or network proxy again this also runs on every node so this take care of the local cluster networking so it ensures that each node gets its own unique ip address and for doing this it may implement the local ip tables or it may use ipvs rules to handle routing and load balancing so so these are the three important parts of the worker nodes so we have learned about the two main parts of kubernetes which is the control pane and the worker nodes okay so there is a third there is a third part as well so the third part is gate dns okay it is like an internal dns service to the kubernetes cluster and it is you know vital for service discovery so what happens is when you start your kubernetes cluster a static ip address is assigned to this kubernetes dns service or ka dns service okay and then your your container will contain many pods okay some do, some of these will be worker nodes some of the this will be control pane whatever it may be this ip address will be hard coded into all these pods okay this static ip address of the dns service will be hard hard coded in all these pods okay why will it be hard coded it will be hard coded so that all of the pods can automatically locate it they don't face any problem in locating it and you know they can use it for service discovery if they want to call any other service or integrate with other service they can discover or find the address of that service using this internal ds service so if this pod 1 wants to talk to pod 2 or pod 3 want to talk to pod 3 what they will do they will discover the ip address of the other another service using this internal dns service you by by using its its hard coded static ip address okay so and whenever we add any new node or any new pod into the ka service they all of them get registered to the internal ds service dns service automatically okay whenever a new service is added it gets registered to the internal dns service automatically so dns service knows the ip address of this new service or every new service that we add to our kubernetes cluster okay so friends in the next video we learn that if we have an application what steps can we take to deploy it on that kubernetes cluster so we will learn step by step what steps we need basically we need to wrap it up in a pod 
and then deploy it using manifest file. So we will understand what is a manifest file, what is the concept of ideal state in Kubernetes. So we'll have an overview of this process. Okay. So stay tuned to our channel. Please show your support by liking this video and subscribing to our channel and sharing this video more and more with your friends and other colleagues who want to learn Kubernetes. We have other videos uh, related to microservices topic and Java interview questions in our channel as well. So please watch them as well. And please show your love. Please show your support. Thanks a lot.